I don't normally comment on X, just lurk most of the time, but I saw this thread and figured why not I'll post. I had three different events, might have to post them separately, might not post all of them if I get tired of typing, I'm bad at green text by the way so I'll just type it out. The first event I had was when I was a kiddo, although I didn't realize it until I was older, but my parents and school teachers did. Before September 11th I was always, always, drawing cities, and would put the twin towers in them burning, although I was like four at the time and I had never even seen them or heard of them, I did this in my agenda notebook, on the desk, on paper at home, all the time, nobody thought anything of it until 9-11 happened and then everyone was very quiet around me, they would try to be really nice to me, they wanted me to draw something other than burning towers, they never told me what, they just told me to. Draw whatever I wanted, don't really remember much beyond that though. Fast forward about a decade and a half, I find my old agenda notebooks in the closet, and see 9-11 scribbles all over them from time periods far before September 11th, I finally went and asked my parents about it and they were extremely squirmy on the subject, but finally they had told me that I was drawing all of this before September 11th and that they were hoping I would just forget. They had told me that my mother apparently predicted a bunch of plane crashes between the 60s and the 80s to excruciating detail, down to the exact locations they would hit, although she lost this ability when I was born. Apparently my grandmother and my great-grandmother had the same ability to varying other degrees, it's really made me question a lot of things ever since though, to the extent that I seriously worry about my own thoughts. Story number two. Significantly after this, but before rediscovering this weird life event of mine, I had another incident take place. I had the day off and had gone to sleep, although once I had awoken in my dream I didn't realize I was asleep. I lived out day after day, week after week, month after month in this dream that I didn't even know was a dream, however it was not a good one. Eventually at some distant future point the space station was deorbited, I do not know if this was intentional, or if it was normal orbital decay, or if it was even the ISS and not just one of the Chinese stations, however, shortly after this there was a limited nuclear exchange in which 36 nuclear weapons were detonated in the Texas Gulf region. I am unsure what happened with the rest of the country though, but I imagine it was catastrophic, services never came back. Shortly after this came airstrikes, no idea from who, it honestly looked like some variant of Su-30 Russian plane, only a few however before those two eventually stopped. About a week after this it got horrific, there were a bunch of anvil clouds that seemingly developed out of nowhere and large spacecraft were seen in them, not emerging Independence Day style, but as if the cloud itself was some kind of portal and these ships were sort of halfway loitering halfway in slash out of the portal, the ships were large angular brick shaped, but had no real texture to speak of. They were a sort of solid stone slash slate gray, and just sat there. We never saw anything come out of them, all we remembered were screams, from everywhere, and these monsters that would peel the skin from children and parents and wear their skin, and they were capable of perfectly imitating the voices of the people whose skin they took, they did this to lure people out of their hiding spots and take them, killing yourself to escape them would not work, they could reanimate the dead. If you killed yourself to escape, it wouldn't work, they could reanimate the dead and keep you on some sort of life support for the sake of experimentation, I don't know why or how but somehow I knew that if they took you that you were theirs forever, there was no escape. However they also had large facilities on the earth. They looked like normal warehouses but the ones who wore people's skin were inside these, they would liquefy humans in here and keep them in devices that looked similar to dryers, and each liquefied human was kept in their own. And we had a hand scanner we could use to find where our person's remains were so we could steal them so that they couldn't reconstitute their remains and make them suffer, somehow we could reconstruct the entire person back to what they were with this liquid. However the ones who wore people's skin had these large poles ringed with symbols that looked similar to Zoroastrian dogmas, I don't know the spelling, and they would fill these poles with the people's liquefied remains and bathe in them, and their children would bathe in them and drink them, and they would try throwing people in and if you fell in then you were one of them. This went on until most of the human race had been wiped out, I do not remember most of what happened as this was a single dream spanning almost 72 years, eventually though their spacecraft were destroyed, most of the life on earth was destroyed, it had become a large desert, 
I remember there were still alligators though, and whatever had transpired had killed the sun, it was slowly dying, as if perhaps they had siphoned energy from it to escape, I don't know if anyone intervened on our behalf. But I think someone did, but I remember I was walking with a girl in a blue dress, she was my wife, I don't have a wife in real life mind you. But anyways me and my wife in the blue dress were walking down the road, there was a small ditch on the left side, with a few alligators in it, and a line of trees on the other following the ditch, we were walking home, and there were bits of these spacecraft everywhere, the sun looked like it was setting, but it wasn't, damaged or something as I stated in previous post, but we finally got home it was getting close to night time. I then remember her whispering to me very quietly, we need to be quiet and turn all the lights off or they'll see us, we did this, and saw lights on the horizon slowly blinking out one by one by one, I don't know if the lights were really close enough or not, but I could swear I heard distant screaming, like there was a reason their lights were going off, as though even in our victory we were still being hunted, I do not know what our enemy was, we all just called it, them. I woke up after this, and realized I had been asleep for almost 14 hours, normally I sleep 7 and a half, and that this 72 years of mine had all somehow been a complex fabrication of my imagination. However, every single event leading up to this has happened so far again, every single last one, and I fear that either I am once again in the long dream, or that it has become reality this time, and we are about to see tribulation. What events have come true, and what's coming next? Russian invasion of Crimea, Iraq falling apart and returning to a fractured state, Syrian intervention. The next things to come along are that the rest of the Middle East falls apart, not just what we're already seeing but Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Iran, pretty much everything except Israel, eventually a space station, no idea which one or when slash how, will deorbit, a war between Russia and the US is going to kick off, it's inevitable, Russia is going to invade up through Mexico. The red line is how far into the US they end up advancing due to aid from the native Mexican population. Initiating an insurrection due to increased nationalism, and a weak quasi-breakup of the US following a civil war. The green circle is a flashpoint where Russia didn't invade at first, they stayed on one side of the ship channel until finally attempting to cross it and that's when things go nuclear, 36 nuclear weapons are exchanged in and around the green circle, I have no idea how many are exchanged elsewhere as that is the last time we have internet or TV ever again. Many other electronic devices and vehicles still worked however, mostly older ones though and for some reason as I said the handheld scanner for finding humans worked. Russia does a few more strikes with aircraft that I assume were hardened against the initial nuclear exchange, although they very quickly stopped as I imagine they likely ran out of fuel or some such other reason, very soon after this is when the ships arrived. Damn dude, that actually seems somewhat plausible. Question. If I end myself right when the space station falls out of orbit will I still be able to be reanimated slash liquefied by those things? Any idea of what they looked like or no? They are able to reanimate the bodies if they're fresh, I don't think they can if they've been dead for a long time or in the ground for a while, but I think there's about a one week window that they still can. I wouldn't advise killing yourself though obviously. I'm not sure what they looked like, they were always wearing human skin when I saw them, although it was sort of loose and they would walk upright like humans, but they could run faster than any human, and even faster on all fours, even the child-sized ones were stronger than any human, there was no way to kill any of them either, I don't mean that figuratively, I mean literally in my entire time I had not seen a single one die. They had a weird sort of glow to them though, like you could see under the skin where they had glowing machinery or augmented body parts or something that were part of them, and some of them the heads didn't look right because you could see the human skin on them but you could see four or five glowing white eyes under the skin. The only way to survive was either run, which wasn't advisable because they will catch you on foot, or hide until they leave, but even that wasn't too good because they were extremely quiet and would just sit there and wait outside of doors silently until people opened them and then they would take them. The only people who really survived were the ones who had already gotten to the middle of nowhere when the nuclear war went down, or those who had basically given away their own as bait to lure them away while they escaped. 
I would not doubt for a second that by the end of the 72 years there were probably only a few hundred thousand people left on Earth, if even that many. My scanner isn't working so I can't upload anything I've drawn about this stuff without it being low tier quality but from what I can tell, their technology is compartmentalized, as in they have several tiers slash hierarchies of technology, whether this is due to them being an amalgam of civilizations or not is unknown to me, but I think it might be a similar reason to just not wanting us to get their technology. I'm pretty sure the hand scanner was theirs, but I was based off existing human technology, or maybe human technology was based off of it. I'm not sure. Most of their other stuff was absolutely useless to us though, there was no way for us to use it, somehow with these portals being open they were siphoning some kind of energy that powered the ships completely different from electricity, although I'm not sure they even needed the portals TBQH. Without this energy the pieces of their ships were literally nothing more than useless common metal slash alloys, they somehow underwent some kind of rapid breakdown without the energy source, I don't remember how the portals closed or how the ships were destroyed, I was in the middle of nowhere at the time, I'm almost certain, 90% anyways, that they're some kind of scavenger civilization. They wait for civilizations to wipe themselves out and then it's like it's some kind of cosmic law that, for the most part everyone is allowed to pick through the remains, which I think is what happened after the nuclear war, and I think someone didn't like this and kicked them out, but not before they damaged the sun as a final F you to humans and whoever helped them. As I said though it was not fun, there was something left behind, I don't think it was them though, I think it was something else, it was something in the long dark that would eat people, they didn't glow and I never saw them, I just knew not to ever show any light at night time ever, and when it was night we slept underground, part 2 in a second. We slept underground under the house in case the things in the dark came inside and found us. I think they were little more than animals, maybe something they left behind, but I don't know. I don't even know if the long dark was permanent or not, as that's when the dream ended, the sun was dying, it was also possible in addition to this that it was nighttime as it was that the sun had died or that they had moved an object in front of it to obfuscate the earth, or maybe it was residual atmospheric debris from the nuclear war and everything else that had happened. I know for a fact that something did happen to the sun though so it could have been a compounded mixture of these events. In addition to this, I remember one time during this dream, a different occasion, where I had gotten onto one of the ships somehow, and I saw what happened to the people who were taken, they were intubated in their back and burying body parts, not too much unlike the Matrix, however there were far more cables and other mechanisms that I have no idea what they were, but if you died then these devices let them bring you back, and most of the people attached to these devices were spliced open. With organs showing or missing entire pieces of their bodies, there were a few people who weren't much more than heads with gore sticking out of the bottom, but they were still intubated and kept alive and mostly just screened, the inside of the ships was the same slate grayish color but there were colors made of energy, perhaps as electronic interface panels of some sort, but probably not, it wasn't pretty colors though, just varying shades of white slash yellow slash light light bluish. It was very basic too, none of that HR Geiger alien style, the ships were very utilitarian in design on the inside, everything served a purpose and only that purpose, no decoration whatsoever. In addition to all of this, I say Mexican uprising, what I mean is that the Mexico aligned with Russia and most of South America slash Central America, so this coupled with Russia allowed for a fairly robust invasion, the US had been weakened substantially already as I said due to the internal civil war, whether it is related to this election or not though I'm not sure, under normal circumstances I doubt they would be able to pull off an invasion though so we must have been fairly weakened, I know. The White House and the Capitol was taken by the People's Revolutionary Force, bad name but that's what they called themselves or had grown to be called anyways, so for the most part the government had already been decapitated before the invasion. In addition to all of this, again, the invasion and subsequent nuclear exchange had all come about very quickly. I was out in the backyard with my mother putting white Christmas lights in the backyard as patio lights. I don't think it was near Christmas though. We had literally walked inside and my dad was laying on the floor watching TV and had said, well I guess we just started World War 3, and not 20 seconds after that the first flash went off outside near what would probably be the Pasadena area of Houston, 
followed by the large area of petrochemical plants on the other side of the ship channel, they look to be fairly low yield, 10 to 20 kt range, as though they were specifically trying to target smaller areas, but I don't know, we got the shockwave where I was and our windows were blown out but the building was still intact with little damage. I had never said they were glowing green under their skin, I don't think I did, they were glowing the same as their ships as a sort of white slash yellowy bluish color, I don't have a word for it but it wasn't an earth color, I speculate on the machinery but there were bits and pieces poking out through the skin and holes in the skin due to some people's skin going necrotic. The machinery under the skin looked like a very similar stone gray as their ships, the skin was pretty contorted on there. Bodies in some cases though, as I said multiple eyes covered by the skin sometimes, or others where the skin didn't exactly fit them right, they still had mouths though, but I don't think it was for eating, I think perhaps it helped them grab onto people or for the express purpose of killing or subduing them, I don't even know if they were technically alive or if they themselves were just biological machines. Some of them really seemed like they wanted the skin as trophies more than anything. Though, they collected it and some of them were wearing multiple layers, and as I said I have no idea whatsoever as to why they would liquefy the people and put them in the dryer machines in the warehouses, surely they had some purpose, but I don't know, it could just be as simple as storage or perhaps some religious purpose of theirs, they seem to have some interest in Zoroastrianism as I said. I don't know how even a breakaway civilization could fight them though, from my understanding they were possibly the first intelligent species ever throughout all dimensions, or one of the first anyways, I can't imagine anyone from this planet could even fathom a way to fight them, it would have had to have been someone else out there on their technological level. I have no idea what skinwalkers are, can you give me a link? The ship in that video looks nothing like their ships, sorry, they didn't have digital displays like that. It was kind of like some strange form of hard light formed out of energy or something, but it had solid pieces that it looked like if the hard light turned off then they would fall to the floor, but they didn't, they sat there in a static position, the ship had no windows whatsoever either, and any writing anywhere was in the same light slash energy as the consoles, the best I can describe it is. That the ship was as much an amalgam of a mash of technologies as one can imagine, there was stuff that just simply looked out of place for something like that, rudimentary tools along with energy, along with patchwork on the inside of the ships as though they were extremely old, but at the same time they looked like they were made of metal and stone at the same time if that makes any sense. I used to work in the plants and they could actually survive a low yield blast fairly well, as they're built to survive the explosions of nearby units slash plants already, you might have to rebuild the control room and change butterfly valves and anything else with an electronic sensor, but most of the stuff out there that could be that sensitive is buried, my guess is it could only take about a month or two to get it back online, assuming you had workers and assuming the plant itself wasn't hit too close. Sorry I thought you mentioned something about them glowing green. I'm surprised you haven't heard about skinwalkers since they sound so similar to how you say, they act in regards to assuming the form of a human being to entice others to come out. I don't have a link but I've attached a story that hit way too close home with me. What this guy describes is almost exactly what I experienced down to the way their jaw moved. Yeah I figured it was different but I thought I'd ask. Were their ships generally just blocky shaped? They seem vaguely similar to the ships from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that destroyed Earth. Was there any resistance by humanity to these beings in your visions? That's pretty similar yet except they don't drool, although it's possible what you said that they're controlled by them as scouts then, perhaps some kind of brain implant or some such other similar machination, so I wouldn't doubt it. This is my best paint shop rendition of it but it doesn't do it justice whatsoever, the things were massive and intimidating like just up there in the sky solid and unmoving, never once did we see one move, and most of the time you only see like half of it, the other half is usually obscured by fog. I can't make it look like it in paint but the surface is pretty much completely seamless but it can open up, the inside looks like a mix of the metallic stone and the energy when it does, I never saw anything come out though but they would leave these things that looked like giant stone caskets on the ground below the holes in the shits and the things would crawl out of them. The Strange Mysteries of the Caspian Sea 
Sprawled out along the edges of European civilization lies one of the great natural wonders of the world, the Caspian Sea. The largest inland lake in the world, the vast, enigmatic Caspian Sea has long captured the imagination of mankind and has been the birthplace of legends, myths, and numerous mysteries for thousands of years. The ancient Assyrians believed that the lake was from whence the sun rose and set, and the legends of numerous ancient civilizations of the region have been influenced and shaped by this mysterious body of water. Beyond the ancient myths and legends are very real mysteries that have endured through to the modern day, and the lake is pervaded by enigmas both natural and otherworldly. Let us take a tour of the strange wonders of the Caspian Sea. The Caspian Sea is truly a remarkable sight to behold. At 1,200 kilometers, 745 miles long, 320 kilometers, 210 miles wide, and with a surface area of approximately 371,000 square kilometers, 143,200 square miles, it is the largest completely enclosed body of water on Earth. Its waters are slightly saline, around one-third of the salinity of seawater on average. The Caspian shoreline passes along Azerbaijan, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Turkmenistan, through terrain as varied as the rugged mountains of the Great Caucasus of Azerbaijan to the west, and the Turkmen in scorched Kazakh deserts to the east. The Caspian is divided into three distinct physical regions, the northern, middle, and southern Caspian, each with its own unique characteristics. The northern Caspian is the shallowest, comprising the Caspian Shelf and reaching average depths of a mere 5 to 6 meters, 16 to 20 feet. The middle Caspian gets deeper, at an average of around 190 meters, 620 feet, and the southern Caspian drops off considerably into truly epic oceanic depths of over 1,000 meters, 3,300 feet. This depth variation has contributed to thriving, diverse ecosystems and abundant aquatic life, including valuable fisheries of sturgeon, salmon, perch, herring, and carp, as well as other types of marine life such as porpoises and seals. This biological diversity has also made the Caspian an attractive settlement area for humankind since ancient times. The lake served as a great provider of food, salt, and oil for peoples throughout history, as well as serving as a convenient alternative mode of transportation to perilous overland routes. The Caspian's rich wealth of resources gave rise to prosperous civilizations and great economies, with many different cultures sharing the region, trading, sharing, and indeed sometimes going to war with each other. However, there is also a great wealth of mysteries here, spanning everything from mysterious creatures, to UFOs, to lost civilizations and treasures. It seems that among all of the fish and other aquatic organisms that live here, the Caspian Sea is home to something else as well. For years, residents along the southern and southwestern shores of the sea have reported seeing some sort of amphibious creature that somewhat resembles the human being. The mystery beast is described as being around 165 centimeters in length, with a large mouth that flows smoothly into the neck without a chin, and large, elliptical eyes set into an earless head topped with black and green hair. The webbed hands are equipped with formidable-looking claws, and the nose is said to somewhat resemble the beak of a dolphin. It has a solid build, with a protruding stomach and short, heavy arms and legs. Iranians have long known of such a creature, calling it Runin Shah, or the master of the sea and rivers, in part because it is said to often be accompanied by large shoals of fish, as well as due to its purported ability to turn water crystal clear simply by swimming through it. It is said that fish can sense when the creature is near, and fresh catches have been known to produce gurgling noises shortly before it makes an appearance. The thing is said to be seen both in the water and on shore. A fairly high-profile sighting of the mysterious marine humanoid was made by the crew aboard the Azrae trawler Baku, in March of 2005. According to the captain of the vessel, Gafar Gasanov, the creature was first seen swimming parallel to the ship for quite some time. The captain told the Iranian newspapers in Dagi that they had first taken it to be just some sort of large fish, that is until they noticed that the fins looked somewhat off, and that it sported hair on its head. It was at that point that they made the shocking discovery that the thing had humanoid arms topped with webbed hands. 
Shortly after, the thing dove down into the depths out of sight. In their homeland of Azerbaijan, the crew were ridiculed for the story, but the Iranians, with their long tradition of similar creatures in the sea, believed them. The newspaper was subsequently deluged with people coming forward with similar reports of their own. Interestingly, reports of these creatures intensified in correspondence to an increase in offshore drilling in the region, as well as increased seabed volcanic activity in the Babalsera area. Amphibious humanoid creatures are not the only strange creatures said to inhabit the depths of the Caspian Sea. There have been reports of some sort of large, predatory fish prowling the waters as well. In 1998, a fish poacher by the name of Sein Chafarov came forward with a story of a some sort of shark-like creature that terrorized him and his companion. The man was out spearfishing with a friend near a place called Fort Shipchenko, when they spotted a massive sturgeon that they set their sights on. At that moment, a huge, torpedo-shaped fish rushed out from the depths that they at first took to be a shark. The man reportedly shot a spear into the thing's head, but it was unfazed, and proceeded to latch onto his legs with fierce jaws. With this weird, giant fish latched onto his legs, the man made his way towards the surface, where the crew aboard the boat managed to pull him aboard. He was rushed to a hospital where he received a blood transfusion and had his leg amputated below the knee. When asked about what his mysterious aggressor might be, he was inclined to think it was a shark. Are there sharks in the Caspian Sea? According to common knowledge, no. The true culprit remains unknown. What other mysteries lurk under the waves of the Caspian Sea? It just so happens that the area is rife with purported lost cities. The region has long been the stage on which ancient civilizations and cities have mysteriously disappeared. Off the coast of northern Dagestan lies the capital of what was called Khazar Khaganate, the fabled city of Idil. This city flourished from the 9th to 12th centuries AD, and then simply vanished without a trace. Further south, we can find the city of Drabent, which sported massive walls that extended up to 300 meters out to sea, and were said to be crafted by the hands of giants. The purpose of such walls, and indeed how they were made in the first place, has remained a mystery. Along the coast of Azerbaijan, in the Bay of Baku, lies a castle known as Sabiel Castle, also called Bale Castle or Bale Rocks, which was originally built in the early 13th century on a small island around 300 meters offshore and now lies completely submerged in water. This castle has been a part of Azerbaijani legends and folklore for centuries. It is a 180 by 40 meter structure from around the 13th century with a trapezoidal shape and sturdy outer walls that were up to 2 meters thick, suggesting it may have been a defensive structure. Additionally, there were semi-circular towers surrounding the castle of indeterminate purpose, but no one really knows just who built the castle or for what reasons. There are many stories surrounding the mysterious structure. One is that Alexander the Great wanted to conquer a city with a magnificent castle on the banks of the Caspian Sea, but the people steadfastly refused to yield. Alexander the Great asked advice from his teacher, Aristotle, who pointed out that the city was located below sea level, and with only a single large stone preventing water from inundating it. A special liquid was designed to dissolve the rock, and it is said the water came bursting in to inundate the city and its castle. Another legend suggests that there was an enormous earthquake in 1306 which raised the sea level and buried the castle underwater. Yet another idea lies within the name of the castle itself, Sabio. There was once said to be a tribe of people in a land called Saba, which is mentioned in the Quran. It is said that the people of this land worshipped the sun, and for this disobedience to the one true God, they were punished by having their land submerged by the sea. Archaeologists have determined that the castle once had nine rooms, two of them with hearths. An inscription places the date of construction at 1234 to 1235. Among the ruins were also found fragments of some sort of pottery, which was probably used for cooking, as well as pieces of pipes which are presumed to have possibly been water pipes. Within one room was found an ancient coin which was minted during the rule of Sherman Shah Ferabras III, in the first part of the 13th century, as well as various other copper coins, some of them inscribed with the names Ferabers bin Garsasp and Zasif and Nasir, who were the Subantias, 
or Muslim rulers of ancient Azerbaijan from 1180 to 1225. A bizarre feature of the castle ruins is that they are surrounded by nearly 700 large stone panels bearing Persian and Arabic script carved right into the rock, as well as decorations and various images of animals such as oxen, dogs, camels, numerous mythical creatures, even human faces and a life-size depiction of a warrior atop a horse. Additionally, there are genealogies of various serventures written in stone, and it is thought that many of the carved animals symbolize these powerful ancient rulers. All of the carvings are meticulously done, obviously crafted by skilled hands. There is some evidence to show that there were once life-sized stone sculptures of animals such as horses and lions on the premises as well. As to the purpose the castle may have served, it is mostly thought to have been some sort of defensive structure, due to the towers and unusually thick outer walls, although to defend from whom or what remains a mystery. Some have suggested that it may have been some sort of fire-worshipping temple used by the Zoroastrians, a customs office, a monastery, or even a stop-off point for land caravans, or caravansrai. However, for all of the theories, to this day, it is a complete mystery as to who built the castle, for what purpose, or why it has sunk beneath the waves. The Institute of History at the Academy of Science spent 30 years from 1939 to 1969 studying the underwater castle yet even after extensive research were unable to ascertain the answers to these questions, and so Sabil Castle remains a complete enigma. In modern times, the castle has seen a lot of wear from the elements and the fact that it has been submerged for centuries, so only its foundation remains, and although some have been brought up for study, many of the large, inscribed stones remain at the bottom of the Caspian. Due to the dramatic fluctuations in sea level of the Caspian Sea over the centuries, sometimes as much as 7 meters, a large number of mysterious ruins of structures and even entire settlements have been lost beneath the waves, and these submerged ruins have become a magnet for undersea archaeology. The Caspian Sea holds mysteries not only in its depths, but also in the skies above. There have long been reports of mysterious lights in the skies here, and the region is the origin of one of the more interesting UFO encounters in recent years. On August 28, 1991, at around 5 p.m., an enormous unidentified object that measured an estimated 600 meters long and 110 meters in diameter suddenly appeared over the Caspian Sea. The object was picked up on a Russian radar tracking station positioned on the Mangishlak Peninsula, which tracked it at an altitude of 21,000 feet and moving at a speed of around 960 miles per hour. The Russian military was perhaps understandably alarmed, and sent four MiG-29 fighter jets on aggressive orders to engage the mysterious craft and get it to land. If the craft refused to land, the pilots had been instructed to shoot it out of the sky. Upon approaching the unidentified object, it soon became obvious that it was not any type of known aircraft. Pilots described it as being a massive, elongated object that was shiny metallic gray in color, and it was also noticed that there were strange green symbols written on the outside of the craft that were not in any recognizable language. Attempts were made to make radio contact with the object, but when these were ignored, the fighters were ordered to open fire. As soon as they fired a warning shot at the craft, all of the instrumentation related to the weaponry and other electrical systems allegedly malfunctioned, forcing two of the MiGs to return to base immediately. It was reported that as these pilots left the area, all systems returned to normal and they regained control of their jets. The remaining MiGs continued to attempt to fire upon the mysterious craft, but they too soon lost most control of their planes and were also ordered back to base as the gigantic UFO continued unhindered. Meanwhile, the tracking station on the ground was maintaining radar contact with the object and noted that it assumed a zigzag course, and that its speed began to increase dramatically until 45 minutes later it suddenly vanished from the radar. The story would only get more bizarre from there. About a month later, at the end of September, local rumors began to spread of an enormous object that had crashed into the Tian Shan Mountains of Kyrgyzstan, on Russia's border with China, in a craggy, rocky gorge called Shaitan Mazar, which roughly translates to Grave of the Devil. The rumors claimed that those who had stumbled upon the crash site had experienced burns on their bodies and their watches had gone haywire. 
a local expedition of skilled mountaineers, joined by the Russian UFO group, Sakafon, was mounted to try and locate the downed object, but weather conditions eventually caused them to turn back after weeks of turning up no sign of the crash. The region's poor weather also caused the deadly crash of a Russian Air Force helicopter that was tasked with finding it. When the Russian Air Force allegedly finally found the crashed object after weather conditions cleared up, it was reported that members of the expedition experienced severe anxiety and feelings of horrific threat when approaching to around 1,000 meters from the site. At a distance of around 800 meters, all members were beset by a profound state of physical fatigue and potent nausea to the point that some people collapsed where they stood or were unable to go any further. At around 600 meters from the crash, all watches, cameras, and other electrical equipment either malfunctioned or stopped altogether, with videotaped footage being completely erased. Anyone who soldiered on and made it to around 500 meters of the craft reportedly began to display nasty radiation burns, and this was about as close as anyone was willing to get. All attempts to fly over the object also failed, as whatever energy field it was emitting also caused any aircraft in the vicinity to lose control of their electrical systems. In one case, yet another helicopter is said to have crashed and killed all aboard after attempting to remove a piece of the craft's debris from the snow. It is currently unknown what became of the crash site and alleged mysterious craft after this, and if the Russian Air Force has any knowledge of it they're not sharing it. The Caspian Sea is clearly a place of wonders, both natural and historical. However it is also possessed of its share of mysteries as well. From bizarre monsters of the deep, to ancient mysteries, underwater castles, and UFOs, this is a place as full of enigmas as it is legends, myths, and history. What is there to be found here at the Caspian Sea, around it, under it, and over its waves? Whatever the answer to this question may turn out to be, the Caspian Sea will likely continue to capture the imagination of mankind far into the future, as it has done for countless generations of centuries past. Sea Monster vs. Submarine The oceans of the world have long been the alleged haunt of various merfolk, sea serpents, sea monsters, and assorted hulking, mysterious beasts beyond the fringes of our understanding. Since mankind first took to the seas and started our odyssey into this vast, watery domain, sailors have been captivated by such fantastical creatures, and maritime history and folklore is thickly steeped in countless tales of mysterious monsters from the depths. However, Sometimes these creatures jump from out of the cloudy realm of legend and fleetingly glimpsed anomalies to come violently crashing into our reality, indeed into our nightmares. Such is the story of the numerous accounts of sea monsters boldly attacking seagoing vessels such as boats, ships, and yes, even submarines. In fact some of the most harrowing sea monster accounts that involve submarines. It seems that in some cases, mysterious sea creatures do not appreciate sharing the depths with our steel contractions. How did these encounters between man and beast turn out? Let's take a look. Certainly one of the most well-known accounts of an alleged sea monster attack on a submarine occurred during World War I, when German submarines prowled the waters of the Atlantic looking to make trouble. For one German submarine, the UB-85, on April 30, 1918 it was trouble that found them. The story goes that the submarine was discovered floating on the surface by the British patrol boat Coriotsis. At the time the U-boats, as the German submarines were called, were a fairly novel and highly feared weapon of war, known for being invisible, deadly killers of the high seas, so it was quite a fortunate turn of events for the British to come across one that was basically a sitting duck out in plain view. They immediately fired upon it and the submarine began sinking without any attempt to retaliate. Things became even weirder when the British vessel approached and the submarine crew quickly surrendered without any resistance. The crew of the British ship was mystified. The only time most crews saw a U-boat coming was when a torpedo was snaking through the sea towards them, and to have a whole submarine just sit and wait to be sunk and its crew apprehended without incident was mind-bogglingly strange. It wasn't until the Germans were brought aboard and the U-boat captain, Captain Gunther Kreck, was questioned that the reason became both clearer and more bizarre. 
Quake allegedly reported that the submarine had surfaced during the night for the purpose of recharging its batteries, during which there had been a violent surge of frothing water off the starboard bow. When Keck and some crew members had gone to investigate, a creature the captain described as a strange beast had suddenly erupted forth from the cold, dark water and begun clambering up the side of the ship, which had caused the whole submarine to start listing to the side. The beast was described as being enormous, with a small head with large eyes deeply set in a horned skull and a large mouth with sharp teeth that glinted in the moonlight. This strange monster was then claimed to have reached the forward mount gun and to have begun ferociously attacking it, chomping down on the weapon with its formidable jaws and thrashing back and forth. Fearing that the submarine would continue to tilt under the creature's weight until the open hatch hit the sea and sank the sub, all available crewmen had opened fire on the mysterious attacker, yet the thing had refused to let go of the gun mount. It apparently had taken a sustained, intense volley of gunfire to finally make the monster relinquish its iron grip, after which it disappeared into th It is a frightening dramatic account to be sure, but interestingly the official report logged by the British concerning UB-85's capture makes no mention of such a creature, reading simply, UB-85 crack, KPLT Gunther April 30th of Belfast Lock gunfire sunk by the Drifter Coreopsis. Crew took off before the boat sank. There have been several theories offered as to why this might be the case. It has been suggested that the British Navy may have been attempting to cover up the real circumstances surrounding the incident. Perhaps more plausible is the idea that the British simply did not believe the ramblings of the distressed German U-boat captain or that the report of the sea monster was completely fabricated after the fact. The story has very little hard evidence to back it up and indeed could very possibly be heresy or merely a scary war story or tall tale embellished over the years to become maritime legend more than anything else. The veracity of the UB-85 encounter may be in question, but it is amazingly not the only meeting of sea monster and submarine to come from World War I. The cryptozoologist Bernard Uvelmans made mention in his book in the wake of the sea serpents of yet another such violent altercation involving a German submarine, this time involving the U-boat U-28 Schmidt. The report apparently comes from a former German U-boat captain who recounted his terrifying ordeal in 1933. According to the former U-boat captain, Commander Freiherr George G. Bonn Forstner's testimony, on July 30, 1915, the U-28 Schmidt was prowling the waters off of a place called Fastnet Rock, 60 nautical miles south off the coast of Ireland, when it came across the British steamer Iberian, which was carrying a valuable cargo of mostly trucks and jeeps. Upon seeing such a choice target, the U-28 Schmidt immediately engaged, launching a torpedo which spectacularly blew an immense hole in the vessel, causing it to sink so fast that it was reported that its bow sprang up vertically into the air as it went down. Within moments, the Iberian had sunk beneath the rough seas of the North Atlantic, taking all of its 61 crew members to a watery grave. Around 25 seconds after sinking, there was an immense explosion underwater, thought to have been caused by some kind of explosive device on board or perhaps an exploding boiler. Whatever the cause, the enormous detonation sent a huge plume of water into the air, as well as an eruption of debris from the ship, some of which pelted and damaged the U-28 Schmidt badly. Amongst all of the flying water and wreckage, the explosion threw up something else from the depths, of all things a giant, seagoing reptile of some sort. The explosion was so violent that the alleged sea monster was reportedly hurled completely out of the water 80 feet into the air, after which it plummeted back into the sea to thrash and ride about in the wreckage as the horrified crew looked on before sinking into the depths, presumably dead. The monster was described as being an aquatic crocodile, around 60 feet long with a head that tapered to a point, a long, pointed tail, and four legs with webbed feet. What was this weird sea creature and perhaps more importantly, what was it doing skulking about the area in the middle of a noisy naval engagement and how did it manage to be in just the right place, directly over the sunken steamer when it exploded so ferociously? Was this a genuine freak occurrence involving an undocumented sea monster or is this again just tall tales and exaggeration woven into sea lore? 
There is little evidence to go on with this case other than the account given by the captain himself as well as some additional reports given in later years by other crewmen who were present, and none of these witnesses are still alive today. With so little solid documentation, no surviving witnesses, and no further information to go on, it is quite likely we will never know for sure. What do we make of accounts such as these? Whatever one's opinion on the matter is, the sea is certainly a wellspring of the unknown, giving birth to myth, legends, and inscrutable, sometimes violent mysteries. Perhaps one day, when we have managed to gain a further understanding of the ocean's wide array of enigmas and strange creatures, we may finally find some answer that seems to fit. Until then, we can only look out at the vast blue expanses of our world's oceans and wonder. There was a massive nuclear war on Mars. The question is, why? It is possible that Mars was used as the testing ground by the Archangels to practice the revealing sciences taught to them by the higher power. That is if one sees the Anunnaki or Archangels as benevolent, benign, or apathetic in modern times. So it is possible that they used some of the tech they brought with them from Pleiades or Orion to speed up the process of wrecking an already long-term unviable planet whilst simultaneously working on Earth, Nibiru. Once it was set in place. You have it half right. No, it's just factions within our people. What got the planet nuked? Vampirism, that's where it started. Let's say things got out of control. Over a very very long time and someone took it on themselves to bomb it dead. I was on the ground when it happened. Some of us managed to escape. It was a space bombardment. And I don't know who. My memory is bad. But it happened on my wedding night. At empty Olympus there was once a pyramid hotel. With windows and such it was great. Then the bombs came. There was running falling buildings, screaming. Those, people tried to bite me and had to get out. A broken old ship back home to Earth. Didn't make it. Had to crash on the moon. Then nothing. Mars is a highly valuable strategic location. If you're traveling from the inner solar system to the outer solar system or beyond, and vice versa, Mars is the gateway. A space truck stop, if you will. Enough gravity to be useful, but not so much it's too expensive to launch from. In other words, if your enemy is in the inner solar system, and you want to cut off their access to the rest of it, you'd hit Mars, or the other way around, if you were trying to hold this solar system from an outside force, and were getting pushed back and trapped in the inner solar system, you'd hit Mars. Earth isn't a blasted wasteland, so I'm assuming it was the latter, and it was successful. Long ago there was a war. Short answer, yes. Some of the refugees fled here and made it with monkeys and made us. Or something it how the story goes exactly hidden behind a lot of half-truths and lies. Time is cyclical. Humanity will eventually colonize Mars, with the majority of biological humans living under an artificial canopy covering the Bayes Marineris. Artificial humans, robot slash AI and such basically, but this is a simplification because sci-fi is not fully prophetic, will dwell atop Olympus Mons. As humanity decays in its downward slide back to the beginning of its cycle, the two sides will come into conflict and ultimately annihilate each other, wiping out nearly all evidence of their presence there. Wouldn't it be insanely easy to destroy all life on a planet if we're talking interplanetary warfare? Be some other space world. Have uranium. Start sending massive clumps of mass, akin to rods of God, to space. Add nuclear propulsion to rods of God. Send to Earth. Wouldn't the amount of energy in these be akin to a comet with life wiping potential? It takes a gigantic amount of calculation and observation to accurately hit a planet with a rod of God unless you are in orbit or in the solar system. Wouldn't it be insanely easy to destroy all life on a planet if we're talking interplanetary warfare? I assume yes. In Earth war we constantly have to be careful to not kill civilians. If you are going to war with another planet that you do not have to live on, you can mess it up as much as you want. 
Wouldn't the amount of energy in these be akin to a comet with life lightning potential? Nuking the hell out of a planet sounds a lot easier use of that uranium. There was a civil war between the imperialist central government and separatist states seeking to overthrow the regime. They didn't have nuclear missiles, but the separatists rigged a power plant to blow up. Nobody really understood the scale of the destruction to follow. Two possibilities that I've heard. One is that Earth and Mars once orbited Saturn, all three have roughly the same tilt, then something pulled those planets out of Saturn's orbit and transferred them to the Sun. Another is that there was a planet here the asteroid belt is now, it was a water planet called Tiamat. Some alien race was being chased down by another and hid on Earth, but they planted decoys on Tiamat which was destroyed by the group that was pursuing them. The destruction of Tiamat caused floods on Earth, but hit Mars the hardest. Something pulled those planets out. That would be the introduction of Venus, the fallen star, Ishtar etc etc. Mars, Tuesday, the god of war certainly lends itself to the notion of a cataclysm or war desolated Mars. Perhaps fallout from when the two planets crashed into each other and created Earth and the Moon. There's a lot of half-truths out there. I've done some intuiting with Jesus and a pendulum about the solar system and who owns what and who or what lives where. The following is the present situation. Mercury is inhabited by dragons. The good book reading kind, not the draconian child rapists. These dragons are on good terms with the Alliance and moved into Mercury because they can handle the climate. Venus is inhabited by elves from Sirius B. They conquered it from the forces of evil which include Draconians and Afiakans. Birth is far, far larger than we're told. Everything outside our firmament is a war zone now, but the Alliance is winning. They can't tear the prison walls down until every prison warden has been terminated. Mars is now in the hands of that same alliance. Fragments of men who chose to stay behind for the Great Flood and survived it in the Martian underworld reconquered the nuclear wastelands from evil. Three weeks ago the war was still ongoing. The asteroid belt is a whole other tragic story. I don't know enough about its history, but let's just say Ceres isn't mineral. Either it's a battle station or a shipwreck of one, much like Luna, Phobos, and Deimos. Jupiter, however, is very plain. It has always been an Atlantean-Lemurian type of split society where good and evil tolerated each other by staying away from each other. The good lived on the surface, the evil lived in the Jovian underworld. By now, however, due to the Stellar War, the Jovians have conquered 90% of the underworld. More importantly, they control the machines now. Jovians are a peculiar mix of humanoid animals. Kigmen, bearmen, werewolves and bipedal bovines, lyrans, etc. It's not without reason that Jupiter slash Zeus sits on the throne. Syrians, lyrans, Pleiadians, Arcturians, they all live there. The first colony. Saturn has been conquered. Formerly reptilian and draconian, it's in the hands of the Alliance now. Even its underworld and most of its moons. Uranus has tragically been lost to the Draconians. Originally inhabited by Pleiadian and Lyran progenitors, pioneer souls who forged new lands and border systems, it was the first battle of the Stellar War. While the colony can be recovered, it's gonna take one hell of a fight to reclaim it. Neptune on the other hand remains strongly in the hands of the Alliance. Its dominant souls are Arturians and Pleiadians. The majority of the inhabitants are Elder Souls and Angels. Soldiers, Commanders, Neptunians are by far the most battle-hardened. It's not discourteous to others. Elder Souls and Angels have been fighting evil for millions of years at a time. The veterancy comes with experience, and it's this veterancy which puts Neptunians in charge of the Alliance and of plan, which truthers think to know but have no conception of. Which leaves us with two more planets and a bunch of battle stations. Pluto is still in reptilian hands, and is subject to a blockade at present. The tenth planet however is completely totally and royally screwed. Call it Nibiru if you want, I call it caught in between dimensions. 
The whole place is stuck in a time loop at a fixed point years ago and years ahead. It's a huge planet, far bigger than Jupiter and Saturn combined, but it's as broken as it is big. If you've ever played Warframe and know about the Void, that's basically what's happened to Nibiru. They didn't pull that sci-fi out of their arse for the video game. The important takeaway is that the Alliance is winning, and that Trump's not in it. The original DJT was meant to be the second beast. He was replaced and terminated in his infancy. The replacement entity is a Neptunian and he's safe somewhere off-world beyond the illusion. This is critical, everything you see and hear about Trump at this time, about White Hats and Elon Musk and Kushner, is a Luciferian pantomime, and the Luciferians are dead. The aliens visiting Earth and ruling Earth are from our solar system and they destroyed Venus with Type 1 Civ Tech and Mars with nuclear holocaust. Humans were uplifted to be a slave race because it was easier than robots. Once their societies were destroyed and they messed with our DNA and culture they just hopped into spaceships and zipped around the solar system at high speeds to let time accelerate. They land after five years of their time and their human slaves puppet through religion and centuries pass and cities are built. Chances are we are advancing quickly technologically because eyes from outside our solar system showed up so they need to arm their slave race to defend the surface while they dig bunkers on Earth, asteroid belt, or elsewhere to hide. Chances are no matter what happens we humans will be fighting to continue our own enslavement while we are told otherwise. Venus was ripe to make reptilians as Mars with grey insectoids. There was a massive nuclear war on Mars. The question is, why? Because they tried to do the same to Earth. Once we noticed they launched their weapons which would destroy our world and set back our technology and society thousands of years, we nuked them. They were warned and ignored that, so they paid the price. Too late however. But we could rebuild. They, being dead, could not. Ha. Huh. I contemplated this a while ago. Not sure about Mars and Venus. Probably similar connections. But Jupiter and Saturn went to war. Cut us tall thick vow. Jupiter was hit first. Saturn shot a weapon into Jupiter which pierced most of Jupiter. The hole was the size of a large planet. That hole became known as the Red Eye of Jupiter. Jupiter retaliated before the planet met its end by shooting a similar weapon to the top of Saturn. This weapon destroyed Saturn's crust. Basically turned it to dust and launched it into orbit slash atmosphere. Possibly a gravity weapon. Both races lost everything. Both Mars and Venus are failed Earths. Man lived on them, but the branches of the tree that is man were cut off because Mars and Venus are not the middle way that man's oversoul ascends through. Bees, bananas, and wheat come from Venus. Before my grandfather died, I convinced him to tell me a bunch of different stories about his time as an American soldier in Vietnam. Quite a few of them are paranormal slash out of the ordinary, so I thought that I should share them with slash x slash. If you have any knowledge about the Vietnamese paranormal stuff, please share, as I have a limited understanding of the subject. Also, a wartime paranormal story thread, I guess. First a little bit of context. Be my grandfather. Drafted, sent to Vietnam. Infantryman, private. On top of this, my grandfather is really short. Like 5 feet 4 inches short. Gets assigned as a tunnel rat. Disarm explosives and booby traps above ground. Fight through and destroy Viet Zone tunnels below ground. Well, may as well shoot me right now. Another guy in his platoon, half Hispanic, is short, not as short as him, but still short. His name is Daniel, and is assigned as a tunnel rat with my grandfather. Together they go on amazing subterranean adventures. JK, some of the stuff they saw was, according to my grandfather, horrifying and mind-boggling. Continuing. Story number one. Sent to clear out and destroy the tunnels. Equipped with a flimsy flashlight, bayonet, some explosives, and an old revolver because the M1911 were apparently bad for clearing out tunnels. Basic mission, they've done this a couple times before by now. 
Tunnels are pretty small, even for a rat tunnel. Not finding any traps or Viet zone, the tunnels almost seem abandoned. Whatever, they stay on guard for booby traps or armed cons lurking behind corners. Come to a larger section in the tunnels, they can stop crawling and go into a crouching slash half-standing position. They can hear water running through the tunnel, start to think that they either are above a river, or that the tunnel just lead into a watery cavern. Daniel shines flashlight over to the other side of the room, sees about four completely massive spiders. My grandfather says that they were longer than a foot, and each had a leg span of about 2.0 to 2.5 feet. Three of them were bunched up right next to each other, one was resting about three feet away from the cluster. My grandfather hates spiders, he sits there paralyzed. Both of them sit there quietly, just staring at the spiders. This goes on for about two minutes. Grandfather takes his eyes off the cluster, looks towards the other one resting alone. It's not there. It's not there. My grandfather looks around and sees the spider on his left, slowly but steadily advancing towards them. He screams, fires at the thing. Doesn't even seem to slow it down. He hauls ass back up the tunnel, with Daniel following close behind him. Daniel throws a grenade into the chamber as they are climbing back up through the tunnels. Make it out, screaming and yelling about spiders. Nothing follows them out, must have died from the grenade, or it just stopped pursing them. My grandfather told me after the story that he is pretty sure that it wasn't even a Viet Song tunnel they climbed into, but a tunnel that the spiders themselves made. Continuing. Story number two. This one is shorter. Once again, crawling underground to destroy a Viet Song tunnel. Crouch walking through the tunnels, they find a not-so-hidden booby trap. It's one of those ones booby traps that would release a bunch of scorpions or snakes upon tripping it. Grandfather and Daniel stop to consider their options. Figure that they might be able to disarm the trap. How hard could it be? Pretty hard apparently. This one was very complex for some reason. Not sure how to disarm the trap without releasing poisonous death animals. They decide to just blow it up, hope that the tunnel doesn't collapse. America.png Back up a good bit, lob a grenade over in the general direction. Wait. Collateral damage. Trap is gone, continue forward. As they get to where the former trap was, they notice another tunnel, exposed by the grenade. Out of the new tunnel comes a five feet long centipede, which barrels right past them and down deeper into the tunnels. Screw underscore this dot JPEG. Not wanting another incident like with the spiders, they plant their charges and haul ass out of the tunnel. They make it out of the tunnels, shaken, but no worse for wear. Pick related is the first thing Google gave me when I typed in Vietnam centipede. Sorry for slow typing, dealing with stuff in the real world on and off. Story number three. This one actually doesn't involve my grandfather directly, but is about some of the stories that he heard from other guys while over there. At the beginning of the war, my grandfather was talking to a bunch of guys from a different company. They tell him about how they saw a bunch of wild apes in the jungles. B.S. There are no apes in Vietnam. As the war goes on, more and more guys claim to have seen these apes. Oh damn. They called them rock apes, as they threw rocks at the soldiers they encountered. Apparently they were coated in red hair, and were normally about five feet tall. Grandfather still isn't convinced. Thinks that they are either making things up, or are mistaken. A bunch of guys get really defensive. Say that they were awoken in the middle of the night by screams and hollers, while being pelted by rocks. When they went out to investigate, they were ambushed by the things. Apparently the apes were extremely strong, and managed to kill two different soldiers. Still managed to fend them off. Grandfather still doesn't really believe the guy, which was odd because he saw a lot of weird things too. Grandfather says that he also heard stories about giant snakes in the jungles. Story number four. About halfway through the war. 
Orders to clear out some tunnels. Start crawling through. Start faintly hearing voices. Either Viet zones or running water. Keep working their way through the tunnels. Voices get louder and louder. Oh damn, this isn't water. Realize that they are probably really close to a room full of zones. Decide to ambush them, then blow up the tunnels. Pull out their revolvers and rush further down into the caves. Fall into a spacious room. Large white eyes all around them. Damn, that's a lot of zones. Raising his flashlight, he notices they are not Viet Zone. According to my grandfather, they were about three to four feet tall, lanky, white, and had big eyes and ears. They were each wearing a bunch of different clothes, some obviously from looted corpses, others were basically just wearing rags. They make a hissing sound at him and Daniel, and start running deeper into the tunnels. Grandfather and Daniel are kind of awestruck, and don't know what to do. Daniel keeps going on about Latin American folklore involving gnomes and stuff. They eventually just climb out and report the tunnels as being abandoned. Pick related is apparently a Latin American gnome. Just a few weird stories left. Story number five. This one actually doesn't involve tunnels. Day off, grandfather and others resting. A few of the other soldiers go down to a nearby river to cool off. About 30 minutes later, one soldier comes back screaming about how something in the river attacked one of them. Oh damn. They grab their rifles and a first aid kit and run down to the river. Three soldiers are on the bank of the river, one is bleeding profusely and the other two are administering basic first aid. Grandfather says that something tore his left leg completely off. They look in the river, which is now red from blood. They see a giant serpent slash eel-like creature swimming around. Yellowish and a long fins on its side. Said it looked like a massive moray eel with fins. What the hell is this thing? They fire on it, and it darts further down the river. They get the guy back to camp, but he dies of blood loss along the way. Story number six. Grandfather and Daniel about to dive into some more tunnels. About to go in, when they hear a deafening roar come from the tunnel. Says it sounded like a dragon. They are all stunned. Look at a nearby officer, who just kind of shrugs and tells them to go in. Geez thanks asshole. This tunnel is apparently worse than most. Filled with giant ants and spiders. Damned spiders. Anyways, grandfather continues to crawl through. The roaring gets more frequent the further they crawl down. Screw this, not going to die today. They plant the charges right there, and haul ass out of the tunnel. As they are crawling back up, the tunnel starts shaking like mad. They hurry up, and get back to the surface. Everything up there is shaking too. They detonate the charges, destroying most of the tunnel. Roaring and shaking proceeds to stop. I might be a little longer on the next one. It's long, and probably the weirdest and most unbelievable of the bunch. Story number 7. Last paranormal story I have. Even I have a hard time believing this one at times, but my grandfather was almost certainly sincere when telling it. He was crying, and absolutely racked with grief. This one is also a two-parter. Near the end of the war, once again, clearing out tunnels. No creepy crawlies thus far. Crawling through, they realize that this tunnel leads into a cave of some sort. They explore the cave for a bit. They are about to head back up, when they realize that there is a light coming from one of the passages in the cave. Not either of their lights. Oh damn. They grasp their revolvers and walk through the passage. My grandfather says that they walked into a well-lit room filled with brightly colored plant life that they couldn't recognize. The light was coming from an orb on the ceiling of the cave. Vividly colored birds flying around everywhere. What the actual F is this place? Him and Daniel explore a little. Among other things, he finds spiky red fruit the size of a watermelon, 
and a bright yellow pool of water. Grandfather says it looked like he was is in a fever dream. They head towards the back of the room. Find a stone altar. Blood is stained across the stone, and there is a couple of knives and other tools lying about stone. Their curiosity turns into dread. They turn around to get the hell out of there. Story number 7 Kant. They stop. There are five reptilian-looking humanoids staring at them. Says they were about 5.5 feet tall, blackish-green, and scaly. They all appear to be wearing robes of some sort. Without hesitating, my grandfather and Daniel fire upon the creatures. One goes down, another shrieks out in pain. The room gets extraordinarily bright, and my grandfather passes out. Grandfather wakes up, back in the main part of the cave. The passage him and Daniel went down is gone. Daniel is also lying next to him, but is barely breathing. My grandfather can only do so much for him down here, and drags Daniel out of the cave and back up through the tunnels. He gets back out, and hauls up Daniel. They grab him and send him off to get medical attention. After pulling Daniel out of the cave, Grandfather remembers about what he saw in the cave. Says that his vision once again goes black, and that he can't even remember the next two days. According to the other guys in his platoon, my grandfather was in a state of shock. He apparently could barely speak, and stuttered a lot. Almost like he was shell-shocked or something. He was also set to get medical attention. Two days later, he mostly recovers. He goes back, asks the platoon about Daniel. Apparently he died shortly after being pulled out of the tunnels. Grandfather breaks down. Apparently the war was close to ending after that. He only delved into two more tunnels after that experience. He legitimately hated anything subterranean after that. He despised caving, insects and lizards, and even requested to be cremated so that he wouldn't be buried underground. I showed him a picture of a generic reptilian alien, pick related and he just about had a heart attack. He said that it just needed to be blacker, but that besides that it was pretty close. I don't have any more paranormal stories from my grandfather about the war, feel free to share if you have your own. Hey stalker, hope you enjoyed the video. If I could trouble you, give a like and a sub, it really helps the cause. Since you're already here, why not watch the next video? Anyways, stay comfy. Cortisol is bad for you.